Are you dealing with a narcissist and you want to know what kind of mind games they play? In this video, I'm going to give you seven of the mind games they play, the most common ones, so that you'll have an insight into their stealthy, sneaky little minds. And that way you'll be able to spot what's going on long before they start to play their little tricks on you. Hey there, I'm Rebecca Zung and I am an attorney. I'm a narcissist negotiation expert and I help people get out of that cycle of the drama, trauma, and chaos, and into lives of freedom, possibility, purpose, so that you can finally breathe again, so that you can finally feel joy and feel your lives again. Doesn't that seem like amazing? I know right now you're probably feeling hopeless and helpless and paralyzed. I know where you are. I've felt the pain. I've been there myself, not just helping my clients because I have helped them too, but also because I've been there personally. I've dealt with a couple of covert narcissists myself, and that's why I'm on this mission. And that's why I'm here giving you free content every single day. And that's why I encourage you to subscribe to this channel, hit that notification bell. And if you are dealing with a narcissist in a negotiation setting, I have a free booklet for you. It will help you if you are negotiating with a narcissist, whether it's in a business setting, workplace, you're dealing with a, a bully in the workplace, you're dealing with it in a divorce setting, a co-parent, toxic parent, grab this. It will help you. Crushmydeal.com. Get it right now. Totally free. All right. Seven mind games played by narcissists. Watch all the way to the end so that you can get all seven. Number one, all narcissists do this. Covert, malignant, grandiose, whatever kind of narcissist it is, you know it, gaslighting. They love this one. They love it. It's their favorite. One of the most common types of games played by the narcissist is Gaslighting, named for the movie or play from the 30s called Gaslight. In that movie, the husband was trying to make the wife think that she was crazy. And so he was blowing out gaslights and she would go, wasn't that just lit? And he'd go, no, no, it wasn't. Trying to make her mind play tricks on her. And that's what gaslighting is. It's a form of psychological manipulation in which the narcissist attempts to make their target or their victim or whatever word you want to use think that they're going insane. You didn't hear what you heard. You didn't see what you saw. The conversation that you thought you had, you didn't have. The thing you think you're seeing, you're not seeing. That's what they do. It, they're trying to make you question your own memories, your own perception of reality, your own sanity at the end of the day. And honestly, when this is happening to you over and over and over again by somebody you are supposed to be able to trust, maybe even love, by somebody who comes at you with authority a lot of times, you do start to question yourself a lot of times. And a lot of times they tie it just enough to reality, just enough to certain events that you start to wonder, wait a minute, am I thinking, wait a minute. You do start to wonder if you're imagining things and you do start to wonder if you're going crazy. And so that's number one is gaslighting. And so you just, you have to start documenting things. You have to start writing things down, start journaling things and start pushing back and start going, no, that's not how it happened. That is not what was said. That is not the way the events took place. Right. That's number one is gaslighting. If you heard it with your ears, if you saw it with your eyes, then that's the way it happened. Trust yourself. Trust your gut. Number two is playing the victim. They like to 
turn things around so that they become the victim, especially if they are under attack for their own behavior. They like to make a lot of noise so that it makes it look like they're the ones who's the victim and you're the one who is the problem. You're the one or somebody else is so that they don't have to be culpable. They don't have to take responsibility then for their own behavior. And that way, somebody else is the one that's causing all of the problems. And they, they even try to make other people feel guilty. And a lot of times it works. A lot of times it works. And, and you know, they can even get marriage counselors to believe that the other person is the problem. Third parties, blind monkeys, all kinds of people to believe that other people are the problem. File false allegations, use the court system, get the judges to believe, get the mediators to believe. They can play the victim to all sorts of people. They really can make it seem like somehow they are the victim in the relationship. If the other person doesn't somehow change their, their, their behavior in some way or do something, you know, that they're being treated poorly, that they're being treated unfairly. And, and, and it can happen very easily because of course, narcissists are extremely easily slighted. I mean, the wind blows the wrong way and they're easily slighted. It, you know, you can not even slight them. You can say nothing about them. It, it, it can be a conversation that's being had over here. It doesn't even have anything to do with them. And suddenly it's about them. And now they're the victim. They can really cause a lot of trouble in this particular game where they're being the victim. The whole it's not fair thing. They're very good at the it's not fair thing. And being the victim. So that's number two. Number three is love bombing. It's another big mind game that they play. And I, you know, this is a very misleading word because there is no love involved in love bombing. It's all about manipulation. It's all about getting you to love them, but there's no love happening in the other direction. It's all about getting you to be charmed, to think that there's something special. They make you believe that they think they, you know, you're special, that you're incredible, and that you're the most amazing human being that ever walked the planet, even though they don't think anything of you other than what are you going to eventually be able to do for them? How are you going to be able to make them look? Are you going to be able to give them adulation? Are you going to be able to service them in some way? What are you going to give them? Because they, they want to give you as little as possible. They want to create a, a sense of dependency on, on them, just in the sense of they don't want you to have to go outside the relationship for anything else. I mean, they want you to get all of your relationship, you know, needs met in that relationship, except that oddly, they don't want to have to give you anything in that relationship. You're supposed to not go outside the relationship for anything, but you won't get anything from them either. So you just won't get any relationship needs met at all. You're just supposed to serve them. And, and then there's, they're just going to get withdrawals from you. So at the end of the day, you get nothing from anybody. And then you're just supposed to serve them. So, and, and you know, they'll just treat you however they want to treat you. They'll give you as little as possible. You know, they'll be back and forth. And then, you know. If they give you anything at all, then you're supposed to think that you, they're just amazing for doing that for you. I mean, if they give you coffee in the morning, then look at that. I brought you coffee. Look at this. Look how wonderful I am. That sort of thing. So love bombing at the beginning is, is what they do to 
shower affection upon you. And this is a business partnership too. They do the same thing if it's a business partnership as well. In order to gain your trust, in order to kind of groom you, condition you to get you into their world so that they can eventually withdraw that attention and affection and get that back from you. All right. So that's number three. Number four is playing hot and cold. And in this game, this mind game played by the narcissist, they alternate between giving you that attention and affection and love, and then just abruptly shutting it off and ghosting you and not returning texts or not returning calls or not returning any sense of affection or whatever. And they do this to create that feeling of insecurity and anxiety in their victims, in their targets to try to keep you guessing, to try to keep you feeling insecure, to keep you off balance and make you feel confused and make you feel off guard and just to control you because it's sort of evil and maniacal and they kind of get off on it in a way as well. And they will, they want you to come back and they want you to kind of beg and they want you to kind of feel like, oh, you know, please, 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 you know, and then when you do beg, they, they want to be able to rebuff you and they want to be able to say no, and they want to be able to reject you. And, you know, they, they enjoy that whole process too. And then they, they enjoy the process of taking you back and, and giving you the affection again. And they like that and they, they enjoy the drama of it too. You know, narcissists enjoy a dramatic relationship. They like all that craziness. They don't like just being even. So that's another mind game that they play is this, this hot and cold. So that's number four. Number five is triangulation. And that is, you know, another name for that is flying monkeys and to third parties. And they try to line up people against you or for them in order to create this divide between you and other people and make you feel bullied. It's a form of bullying. It's to make you feel isolated. It's to make you feel like other people are against you or make you feel like they've got other people for you. And there's so many different ways that they can do this, you know, to make you feel like other people are having more important conversations with them or more substantive conversations with them, or what are you talking about with this other person? Or what are you telling this other person? Make you feel like you can't trust other people or make you feel like these other people are on their side or believing their lies and making you feel like no one else is going to believe you. So why bother? Why bother trying to get anybody else to believe your side? All of these kinds of things. And so everyone else thinks this and no one else thinks that. Those are the kinds of things that they do. And it's to make you believe that you shouldn't bother to try to go up against them because it's going to be a waste of time. You know, again, it's a mind game. And a lot of times it's not nearly as bad as you think. And a lot of times the flying monkeys have no idea that they're being used as flying monkeys. By the way, they use judges in this way, counselors in this way, mediators in this way. And all I'm going to tell you is it ain't over till it's over. And I've seen what seems like a foregone conclusion not be a foregone conclusion. So don't think that it's a foregone conclusion unless the end is actually the end. So you never know. You never know. So that's, that's that. The next one is discrediting. You know, again, it's, it's a similar kind of thing as triangulation, but this one is even like a step further. 
where they play this mind game by actually spreading false allegations, by actually filing false pleadings with the court system, or actually putting things out there on social media, or saying things about the person to coworkers, you know, really spreading things about the person, maybe true or not true, but really trying to discredit the person by saying things that maybe aren't favorable, maybe bringing something up about somebody's past, maybe saying things that might make other people question the person's abilities, question the person's intelligence. And it can be quite damaging at times, especially if it has to do with, you know, their work or their parenting abilities, things like that. Just keep in mind that there are ways to combat that when it comes to work, when it comes to parenting. And again, I, you know, I go back to my slave methodology, strategy, leverage, anticipate, focus on you. Make sure you're documenting. Make sure you have a strong strategy. Make sure you're using your leverage. Make sure that you are using every single possible tool that you have in your hands. There are always ways to get what I call the cream to rise to the top because you can and pivot that, you know? So, you know, step one, don't run. Step two, make a U-turn. Step three, break free. And that's how you write that ship. And that's how you get things to turn around. And that's how you get things to pivot. Don't get things to shift. You don't get the dynamic to shift by running away completely. That is not how you get that dynamic to shift. Remember that narcissists are way more afraid of you than you are of them. You get that dynamic to shift by not running, by turning it all around. Okay. So do not take that bait. And I want you to put that in the comments right now. Don't take the bait. Don't take the bait because you can win. You can turn this around. I've helped many thousands of people do that. I can help you do the same. So don't take the bait. And if you haven't gotten the Crush My Negotiation Prep Worksheet, I don't know what you're waiting for. Get it at crushmydeal.com. And if you are struggling and you need help, with therapy, I do have a partnership with BetterHelp and you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash Rebecca Zung. We do have a partnership with BetterHelp and they do pay us commissions. It doesn't cost you any extra. We just wanted to have a partnership with somebody that we could put out there and say, Hey, we're supported by this, you know, this organization, we trust them and we wanted to be able to have something to offer you. So make sure that you get the support that you need. And we also do have a private Facebook group, which is narcissist negotiators with Rebecca Zung. So join my free private Facebook group. If you want that extra support as well. All right, let's go to the last one. What is the last thing that narcissists do? What is the last mind game that is played by narcissists? This is the one that they all do. And that is triggering you. And this is part of my A in slay with strategy, leverage, anticipate, and focus on you. Anticipate that they're going to try to trigger you at every turn because they love that. So anticipate that and be two steps ahead of them. That's what I always say. Anything goes when it comes to getting a reaction out of you. They love it. A narcissist's ultimate goal is to control you. And so therefore, triggering you is a tactic they use to get you to lash out. Okay. That's what they want you to do because number one, it gives them supply. Number two, they'll use your emotional reaction against you. Right. And so remember that as long as they're getting that supply, they're never going to leave you alone ever. So do not, do not take that bait. As I said, don't allow that. Okay, don't take the bait. They will look for your weak points. They will look for ways. They will look for your Achilles heel. They will strike at it. They're like sharks with blood in the water. They're going to look for ways 
to, to, to strike you. And I do have an entire video on how to keep your cool against narcissists. That is the, the next video that you definitely need to watch. If you haven't subscribed to this channel, make sure you do that now. Subscribe hit that notification bell, then go watch that video, how to keep your cool against narcissists. And remember that today is a great day to start negotiating your best life. And then I will see you in that next video, how to keep your cool against narcissists. I will see you there. It's strings attached. So spending money with strings attached, anything related to kind of giving with expectations of something in return, and I think one thing I'll just say about you know, a lot of the items on, on our list that we'll talk about today, there's, there's a handful of them that do come up in regular kind of healthy, functional relationships. And so it's not that one of these, one of these tricks in and of itself means that you're in an abusive relation, financially abusive relationship with a narcissist. Um, but when you start to see some of these things add up, and you've got a little bit of history and a pattern, that's where you can start to kind of identify that these are some of the mind games that they play. Yeah. I mean, narcissists are inherently extremely, extremely selfish people. Um, you know, they are scarcity mentality to the extreme. So they don't like to part with their money. That's for sure. It, you know, they're kind of like, they go back to that whole toddler's creed. What's mine is mine. What's your, what's your, what's yours is mine. Oh, you just took, you just took my number 10. <laughs> <laughs> oh, always number 10. That was it. What's mine is mine. And what's yours is ours. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, they don't like, if they give you anything, there's definitely massive strings attached. Right. I mean, you know, and so what does that mean exactly? If they give you something and strings attached, what does, what does that mean? It just means they're giving, they're giving with something with expectations that they're going to get something in return or that they're giving in order to maintain control. So that's the thing you just have to remember whenever you're dealing with a narcissist is that really everything that they do is about maintaining control maintaining dominance. And so even the things that may seem innocuous or like they're you know, just being generous, they're actually not. They're doing it from more of a, a manipulative point of view. And so whenever, whenever there's you know, a dinner or a gift or any of those types of things, are there strings? You have to ask yourself, are there some strings attached to it? And mm. if you've been in that relationship for a while, you'll start to be able to differentiate between those very, very easily. Yeah. There's something they want or there's some reason behind it, like to, you know, get you to do something or to like maintain control over you or something like that. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, okay. And, um, withholding is like a huge biggie. I mean, they withhold anyway, they withhold information, they withhold, you know, just like sometimes they just like they, they ghost you on like texting you back or, um, you know, um, just. Yeah, just a lot, I mean, a lot, I think to that point, a lot of the mind games that take place around money are also ones that you'll see take place around other aspects. So it's still, it's still all part of kind of that same playbook money tends to be one way that a narcissist can use to try and maintain that sense of control. Um, but these, these types of tricks and, and all of these tactics that they use, you'll find them appearing in, in non-financially related aspects as well. Absolutely. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how will they withhold it as far as money is concerned? Yeah. So like, like one example is an allowance you know, a lot, like, it's not that there's no access to money, because to a certain extent, if there's no access to money, then they may actually be shooting themselves in the foot and lose control because they're forcing you to do something more drastic. So a lot of times what they'll do is, is give a small kind of allowance for all of your personal spending. Usually it's not enough. And, you know, we're not talking about a situation like it's really common 
in families that one spouse kind of takes the lead role with managing finances. Another one may take the lead role with maintaining the household. And there's, you know, really a healthy division of labor based on what your interests are, what your skill set is, where do you have experience, all those types of things. This isn't about that. This is about giving you a specific dollar amount so that if you want anything above that, you've got to come back to them and ask for it. And then they're able to, again, exert that, that, um, that additional control, which is certainly going to be a theme of, of any and all conversations that revolve around narcissists. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, and, you know, another one for sure is sort of like this passive aggressive thing. And I actually experienced it myself in a business partner um, uh, relationship. It wasn't, you know, I haven't been in a relationship with a narcissist in a romantic sense, but I did have a, a covert narcissist in a, a very short lived, thank God, um, business situation. And um, it was like this passive aggressive kind of a thing where, um, hey, you know, um, weren't you supposed to put the money into this account? And oh, um, you know, yeah, I, I didn't know how to deposit it. You know, I have to ask my bookkeeper. So I put it in this other account, my account. And, you know, a couple months would go by and, where's the money? How come it hasn't gone into the business account yet? And so I found myself like in this weird position of like, do I ask about it? Do I not ask about it? You know? And then like, I'm sort of like, you know, am I like the bad person because I'm like asking about it and, you know, and then I ask about it. Oh, I told you I needed to ask my business, you know, my uh, CPA about it. I'm definitely going to do it. And they kind of make you feel bad. Like, you know, I'm and a good person. <laughs> that's the thing you start to, you know, the more as, as these kind of tactics add up before, once you're able to identify it and name it, a lot of that kind of goes away, but until you've really kind of, until that's crystallized in your mind, it becomes where you start to question yourself. Should I be doing this? Did I do something wrong? Am I making a mountain out of a molehill? All these things kind of start to build up where you start to look internally until you, maybe you have kind of that light bulb moment of, well, actually here's what I'm dealing with. I think that's one of the reason why everything that you do in terms of your content is so help can be so helpful to people because it really can help someone to identify what some of these tricks are and be able to name that. Well, and exactly because especially the coverts, like, you know, what I was just describing, because like when you mention something about that type of, you know, behavior to somebody else, you, you know, other people go, well, I'm sure that must have been inadvertent because that person is so nice. I, you know, obviously I'm sure they didn't mean it that way, you know, and then again, it, it only serves to make you think you're crazy once again. And, you know, you know, here you go back to feeling like, bad and you're, you're ashamed once again, crazy again, you know, and that again, it's this mind game, mind game, mind game, right? So it's exhausting. Yeah, it is. It is definitely exhausting. Definitely exhausting. Um, okay. So let's talk about, um, you had some great ones uh, uh, with, um, you know, how, how they, they play this sort of shell game about uh, where they put, you know, debt and title and in whose name and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And you're, I mean, th those two things kind of go hand in hand. You're, you'll, you tend to, I tend to see when I work, I'm working with clients who, who talk to me about how they're kind of divorced, their spouse, their husband, wife, whatever is a narcissist. It's not at all uncommon that I'll see a lot of the debt ends up in, in your name. And a lot of the kind of title to the assets ends up in their name. Uh, this is not something that that tends to happen by happenstance. It's it's really part of the plan to take out credit cards in your name, mortgages, you know, all of the debt. Ultimately, if things go awry and you split, you're going to be kind of stuck holding the bag. Whereas they'll try and convince you to sign a quick claim deed or an interspousal transfer deed in order to take title to the house and put it into their name or joint. So all of these are all of these are things that are trying to to basically accumulate the good stuff 
on their side of the, the equation and take all the bad stuff and stick that over on your side. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, and one of the things I've seen before too is like, you know, the 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 good spouse or whatever was like the saver and you know saved up all their money and then the other spouse was like the spender and spent all of their money and so now they didn't realize that oh i'm gonna have to hand over half of everything i saved to the you know the the person who was just you know frittering all their money away oh great thanks a lot yeah, yeah. yeah and that i mean i think that, that that's a nice lead-in for another one which is kind of the the, the blame and shame. So, you know, a lot of times there's going to be a real, real double standard in terms of how money is spent. And in those situations, you know, you could, you could go out and spend money for tutoring for little Johnny or, you know, dance class for Sally or, you know, things that, that are really kind of part of the day to day and receive a lot of criticism around that. Whereas there, there may still be, and you're, so there's, they're going to be judging you for spending money in kind of the basic ways, whereas they don't expect there to be any repercussions or judgment around their spending money on lavish vacations or taking trips to Vegas or, you know, whatever, whatever it happens to be. That's another one that I see come up a lot is this double standard around how money is spent. Yeah. And, and another thing, actually, as you're saying this, and, and this kind of goes back to that mind game thing, too, is like that sort of shaming you. Um, I mean, you know, there's the double standard for sure. But then there's like that shaming you kind of a thing like, you know, well, you don't get to spend money because you didn't work for it or, um, or you're just lazy or you're not capable of earning anything or you don't have an education or, um, or you're just greedy if you ask for anything. Uh, you know, something like that, like there's like this inherent sort of thing. And, I, you know, I've had a lot of people who will say to me, like, I'm not greedy. You know, I, I just I just want like just enough to like, um, you know, um, to cover this, or I, I'm not asking for this part, or I'm not asking for that, or, you know, um, I, I'm not asking for any money sometimes. Like a lot of times people will say, I'm not asking for any money. Um, and, and, you know, and, and almost as if that's dirty, like it's dirty to ask for money. Um, yeah. And, and, and I'll have to like correct people sometimes and go, what's wrong with asking for money? Like, yeah. let's just shift our mindset around that. Let's have a conversation around what's wrong with asking for money if the law provides for you to get half the retirement or you to get half the assets or for you to get alimony or for you to get child support. If the law is providing for that, if the law is agnostic. Right. Really, I mean, it really means that, that their games have started to wear away at you. They've started to, to work. That manipulation is paying off because your sense of reality begins to get a little bit skewed. And you start to see things through the lens that they've kind of created for you. All those different smoke and mirrors really kind of start to skew your own sense of self and what's fair and what's equitable. Um, so yeah, and, and, and I think the other thing that I see is, as you were saying all of those things is it actually doesn't matter. Like it, it, no matter what the actual circumstances are, they'll find a reason to be able to make you feel shameful. Even if you're making more money or, or are more successful or whatever it is, they're going to oh, find something, an area of weakness, and they're very, very good at that, to be able to kind of exploit whatever insecurities you might possibly have. And if you don't have them, then they'll probably try to create them. Um, and that's kind of how they try to look for their prey to a certain extent. It's so true. I mean, I had a client one time who was a doctor. She was a hospitalist and 
um, her husband was this guy who had basically been homeless or something. I mean, he was a total loser in a lot of ways. Um, you know, good looking guy, but really had just kind of banged around, had never really held, held a good job or anything. And her parents had basically like begged her to come to me to do a consultation. And, um, you know, he was a con artist. He was kind of like that dirty John guy, you know, um, and um, she didn't even end up divorcing him. You know, she, she was, but in the, in, during the consult, she was like, you know, this isn't normally who I am. You know, I, I, I very, very successful woman. And here she was like, so bewitched and beholden to this guy who just felt like she was nothing without him and truly believed that. And here you're looking at it from the outside in. you're like, are you kidding me? Like, seriously, <laughs> I mean, yeah, but he it takes had a lot of work. It takes a lot of work to be able to kind of peel off those different layers that end up kind of coming on, coming on to you and be able to get back to your true sense of self. Really right. Take a lot of work. And, 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 and just to kind of go back to something you said, you know, a lot of times that shaming and all of that, it hasn't just started during the discard phase or like right at the time of the divorce or whatever it started, you know, back, at the beginning almost of the relationship, they've started imprinting and conditioning you to believe that you're nothing without them, that no one else loves you like they do, that you can't a function without them, that you need them in order to, to, to function, you know, like that they have to have control over you. They want you to believe all of those things. And and, and, you know, so that's all part of these mind games. And then, so like that shaming that they do, it, you know, for wanting anything for yourself is, um, that's kind of started like, I think a long, long time before sometimes. Oh, absolutely. It, it usually doesn't start right away because if it starts- Oh no, the, too, the love too, bomb, too they soon, have the love bomb, yeah. Exactly, exactly. You got, yeah. you got to, got to get it going a little bit, but then af after they've, Hold you into their web. Yeah. That's when they really start playing those games. Yeah. 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 Um, so, all right. So what can they do about it? Let's, let's shift to what can they do? About yeah, it? absolutely. I mean, I think, I think to me, the first and most important thing is to be able to name it. You need to be able to kind of come to grips with the reality of who you're married to in a relationship with, have a business partnership with whatever type of relationship it is you need to be able to kind of call a spade a spade. Until you can do that, you really can't begin to take any sort of steps to be able to address anything else because you're actually not able to see reality for what it is. So that I think is the first and kind of most important thing to do. The second one is holding your cards close to the best. And so, you know, what you need to understand is anything that you reveal can and will be used against you. You know, this is very much like if you're talking to a police officer, it's, you're not going to say anything that's going to end up helping you in that situation. The more information that you re reveal, the more transparent that you are, the more that that's all going to come back kind of to bite you because they're going to use that information they're observing, 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 and, and kind of taking mental notes about, well, how can I use this for leverage? How can I exploit this weakness? All of that is really part of the game. So you want to make sure that you, that you aren't more transparent than you need to be and more forthcoming than you need to be. Yeah, totally. I mean, I know like when I decided to try to exit like the business relationship that I was in, I was like, you know, I mean, I, I, uh, you know, I told this person I wanted to be out of the relationship, but, um, you know, I had to be really, really careful about, you know, how much to reveal about what I was working on otherwise, whatever, because I mean, you know, they need as much narcissistic supply as they can. And, 
you know, they, they attach themselves to you because they want that supply. And if there's any supply to be had that's happening around you, they want to make sure that they're not going to be missing out on that. So, you know, you got to be yeah. careful about, um, you know, what to reveal there. And, and what did you go ahead? What, what did you have any, any steps that you took that were particularly effective in getting out of it? Was it tough to kind of remove well, I mean, yourself you just, from that partnership? I mean, you, you cannot allow yourself to be emotionally triggered because they are definitely going to try to trigger you. Um, and you can't look back. I mean, I was just talking to a client, um, the other day and, um, she was like, well, maybe cause the, you know, the guy was like back into like trying to love bomb her into coming back into the relationship, you know? And, and she's like, maybe I could just keep him in the love bomb stage. I'm like, no, 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 no. That is not happening. They don't like the love bomb stage. <laughs> like, you're not going to be able to do that. If you um, figure that out, let us know. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, no, it's not happening. You know, so like, I, I mean, I just was like, no matter what, I'm moving forward and I'm getting the hell out of this thing. And, you know, and it always gets worse before it gets better. And they're always horrible at the end because they don't want to see their their narcissistic supply walking out the door they feel um, the control slipping through their fingers well yeah and they're feeling their supply walking out the door i mean it's like they're vultures and so they're seeing their food source like leaving yeah um and and it's funny because they're horrible to you and yet they want you to stay like why would i stay when you were hor horrible but yet that's you know how they are um, but you know, you just got to keep going and not look back and, and, and then cut off all forms of communication, like every block them on every single platform. And, you know, and really for me, like, I just tried to like, not even have any communication with anyone who was in communication with that person. Like I, I really tried to do that as well. Um, so that, you know, there was no possible form of communication. Um, that that's what worked best for me. But um, you know, I was lucky. I, I you know, it wasn't a romantic situation, and um, no kids. There no were kids. all these kind of the, all of this different entanglement that you can't find a way to truly sever. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I mean, it, it, when it's a divorce situation, it's like, I'm sure so much worse, so much worse. Um, so, um, so what else can you yeah, say? Uh, other steps? I mean, I think, you know, it's, a, it's really is kind of a cat and mouse game. And so in that sense, you know, the narcissist is the cat and you're kind of, you're the mouse. And so you really need to understand you don't want as a mouse, you don't want to become a cat but you really need to understand how a cat thinks, how they operate, how they pursue their, their prey um, in order to be able to stay one step ahead. Uh, there was someone that I was uh, interviewing at one point around kind of financial abuse and narcissistic relationships. And, and the analogy that she used with, with the victims of, of the, this financial abuse was that of a rose. And so the idea there was, you know, a rose has thorns. A lot of people, when they're when they're leaving a narcissistic relationship and trying to get out, they end up kind of overcorrecting. They have a tendency to overcorrect in the other direction, and so now they kind of put up all of these defense mechanisms because you start to understand that that you're by being vulnerable, that's what kind of exposed you to this relationship. And so I really I really like the analogy that she used with the rose and the thorns because a rose is a rose and it has thorns. And so the, the idea there is you can kind of be, you want to be able to identify the people that you need to have your walls up with, that you aren't vulnerable with, that you don't reveal information, but you don't want that to seep into all of your other relationships that are good quality relationships with people where that vulnerability really is what enables you to have some of those close relationships. So it's not that you're changing your identity. 
it's that you actually have both of these things. You have the beautiful flower and you have the thorns. And so I thought that was kind of a really powerful, um, compelling metaphor in a sense. Yeah. I mean, I would definitely say, you know, gather as much financial information as you can before you leave the house, if you can, um, you know, stockpile cash, you you definitely stockpile cash, definitely, you know, go around them if you can, like by just going straight for the subpoenas and that sort of thing, rather than, you know, trying to get it out of them through a request for productions or something, you know, because they're always going to play this stupid game of giving you part of it or not giving you it at all, whatever. Um, for sure, I, you know, there's always going to be this little, um, you know, um, game uh, as far as giving you document d- documentation during the actual court case, for sure. And you need to decide um, in that sense of like, what's the right path? You know, does does mediation make sense if you're divorcing, you know, an extremely rigid narcissist? Or are you really just setting yourself up for a situation where you kind of are going to have to have a choice of kind of agreeing with all of their demands? And even then they're going to kind of move the goalpost, move the goalpost, move the goalpost, because the closer they get to done, the closer they are to, like you said, losing some of that narcissistic supply. Well, I mean, if you have enough leverage, you know, through the slave program, maybe mediation would definitely work. Um, but it just depends, you know, um, sometimes, uh, it, it's a good idea. I mean, a lot of times it's a good idea. Yeah. And it's, um, I think it's not one size fits all, right? So I, I, yeah. I don't mean to imply that mediation is not a good path. Um, and that's in that type of situation, it's just, you really have to be realistic. And you have to be um, ready. Think, you have yeah. to be ready. For yeah. sure. There's a lot of situations where it's, where someone's self-represented or mediation and they spend so much time and money trying to make a process work that just may right. not have a chance you definitely have to know what you're doing for exactly sure. exactly isn't it time that you take your life back all right so what happens when you stop playing their mind games it's well i've seen it firsthand because i help people negotiate with narcissists and i've helped people take their power back stop feeling afraid isn't that what you want yeah Well, so in order to get there, you got to stop playing their mind games. So, you know, when you stop playing their mind games, they're not happy about it because remember how the whole thing got started. They're like looking to you to get that narcissistic supply, right? That's what they, why they attach themselves to you to begin with. They're like leeches. <sighs> they attach themselves to you to suck that supply out of you. I mean, literally, it's like they attached and they came along to love bomb you and they started conditioning you. It's so kind of predictable and sick in a, in a certain way. And whether it's a business relationship or a personal relationship, it really doesn't matter because I personally was in a business relationship with a narcissist and they all start the same way in what they call love bombing stage. It could be, you know, they call it idealization, love bombing, it doesn't matter. But basically it starts off in this where they are super charming They're very good at reading people. They know how to be absolutely amazing. I mean, they know how to be so crazy, wonderful. And I've actually seen people say, why can't they just stay in the love bombing stage, right? Well, because they don't want to be in the love bombing stage. That's not where their sweet spot is. I mean, they want to be in the take stage, not in the give stage. The love bombing stage is just to start grooming you basically so that they can get to the take stage as fast as possible. You know, I've seen this meme that goes around at times that says, you know, nobody falls in love faster than a narcissist who needs a place to live. I mean, that's kind of where it is, right? I mean, they they want to get to the spot where they can, you know, get to you as fast as possible. So basically, they need that supply, that narcissistic supply, which is, 
anything that feeds their ego, anything that feeds their need for adulation or money or that need to control you. It's their food, it's their oxygen, it's their lifeblood. It's, it's, it's anything that feeds their need to make them feel better in some way because they have no sense of inner value. So how can they feel some sense of value? That's basically it. And so they, they condition you from the beginning. And what does that mean? Well, how much can they get away with from the beginning when they've been love bombing you for a while and they come on super strong super strong. We need to move in together right away. We need to be business partners right away. I can get you anything you want. I am taking you to Fiji for the weekend. I will send you 15,000 roses, or we need to be business partners right away. And I can find you all the best clients and or whatever it is. I mean, it's going to be like, it'll swirl in your head and be unbelievable. And your head will be spinning. It'll be so fast. And then all of a sudden, here they are. And, and you're like, wow, where has this person been all my life? And then all of a sudden, once you're in it and you, you're like, okay, yeah, let's do it. All right. And then all of a sudden, you're sending them texts. And then where are they? Gone. And, and then it's, oh, why are you so needy? It'll be like that for a while. So then when you decide, you know what, I'm not playing your little game anymore. I'm done with you. I I'm not playing your games. I'm out of this relationship now. I'm done. And now what's going to happen is you are going to trigger something within them. And that narcissistic rage may fl come flying out or something's going to happen within them because they've got this narcissistic injury that could potentially get triggered. And so it's not going to be good. So what's going to happen is they're allowed to treat you however they want, but you're not allowed to do it back to them. Okay. So now it's going to be either they're going to flood your text messages like crazy, show up at your house or office, you know, go crazy on you, or they're going to try to make you feel guilty as hell. All I've done for you after, oh, uh, la, 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 make you feel guilty. I can't believe you're leaving the family or I can't believe you're leaving me like this. Can't believe you're leaving me an alert to make you feel guilty for what you're doing to them, or they're going to make something your fault. You did this, da da da. Or they're going to get very angry, very hostile. You're going to start to see whoever this person was that tried to pretend, you know, especially if it's a covert narcissist and they tried to pretend like they were so lovely or so nice or so this or that, you're going to start to see how rude and horrible they can actually be. They're going to start to do awful things. Maybe they'll try to shame you or, or really put you down and say things like awful things to you, like nobody else would have stayed with you or no one else will love you or no one else likes you anyway or awful things to you. They might do that. They might try to badmouth you to everybody else, line up flying monkeys and tell people lies about you. They might do that. I mean, really no bar is too low sometimes. Cut you off from things, you know, if it's a divorce, depending on how bad their scruples are, they could use the court system as their sword file unnecessary motions, harassing pleadings, refuse to give up discovery, ignore court orders, use the children as pawns, all those sorts of things as well. Run up the attorney's fees, certainly seen all of that. React with anger, rage, violence sometimes. This is why I developed the slay program, by the way, because you need to have strategy. You need to have leverage. You need to be able to shut them down. And if you agree with me, you need to put shut them down in the comments right now. And, you know, 
you need to have strategy. You need to have leverage. And if you want to learn how to more about how to shut down their smear campaign, you can definitely check out my video on that topic as well. But, you know, this is what happens when you stop playing their mind game sometimes. I mean, so, you know, they go a little bit nuts so sometimes, but you can shut them down. You absolutely can because they're actually more afraid of you than you are of them. They absolutely are. And when they realize they're not going to get supply out of you anymore, and they realize how you can expose them and all of that, they will ease on down the road. You just got to figure out how to do it. Let's talk about that narcissist's most dangerous lie. Um, they lie about everything, right? Narcissists lie as a way of life. They lie about all kinds of stuff, including things that they don't need to lie about, which is kind of baffling to me. And they even lie about things that are readily verifiable, which is also kind of baffling to me. And if you want to know more about specifically about narcissist lies, I would highly recommend that you check out my video called Narcissist Most Common Lies. And I actually do have a, an accompanying podcast to that too. So for those of you who like to get your information in different kinds of mediums, I do have a podcast. It's on every single outlet where you can find podcasts and it's called Negotiate Your Best Life. And you can check out um, that show on narcissist most common lies there too. But going back to what the most dangerous lie is, it is not what you think. It's not like, what are they saying that's so dangerous? It's more how it lands for you. And that's why it's so dangerous. And that is the lie that you desperately want to believe. And the reason why that is so dangerous is because they are constantly packaging their lies in a way that you will believe, that you want to believe, that might be plausible, that seems real, that allows you to ignore those red flags that may be going up in your head. And if you want to know more about why people ignore narcissist red flags, I highly recommend you check out my video on that. Anyway, you will be getting these lies and you're and you're realizing something is off and you see something, you know, maybe you see a text message come through that doesn't seem right and you confront them on it and they have some plausible explanation for it, or it might not even be all that plausible, but you're just like, you know what? I want to believe this person. I want to believe that my whole life is not a lie. I want to believe that this person actually loves me. I want to believe that I'm not in business with a shark, with somebody who is awful. I mean, they don't seem terrible all the time. Sometimes they seem good. And so you end up processing something in a way that ends up maybe they get away with their lie because you want to believe it so desperately. And that can happen in a number of different ways. So one of the ways that they package their lies so that you will believe it, which becomes dangerous for you, is something called future faking. And what happens there is that they say, yeah, you know what, this happened, but in the future, here's what life is going to look like. So if it's in business, I, I'm going to start participating. I'm going to generate all these sales. I'm going to do all this stuff. I'm taking the lead on this particular effort, whatever it is. And then they don't ever do it. Um, and that's future faking. But in that moment, you really, really want to believe it. Same thing if it's in a romantic relationship. You know, you, you get that text message or you see that thing happen or they didn't show up for something or they didn't do something that they were supposed to. They didn't get you the birthday gift they were supposed to. They didn't take care of your kids the way they were supposed to or blew off your mother or whatever it is. And you, you call them out on it and there you go having a conversation, which is... Um, 
you know, that's never going to happen again. Uh, you know, uh, let's forget about the past. Let's just think about the future. Let's just take it from here forward because from now on, you are going to feel appreciated. You will get everything you deserve. You are the best at everything. And whatever blah, comes out of their mouth that they have to say in that moment for you to believe them. And, you know, for a variety of reasons, sometimes you, you just want to believe them. So you do. And so more time goes by. And now you're investing more of your life and more of your time and more of your energy into this person. And the more you invest, the more you, wanna, you want it to work, the more you want to believe the lies. And if you just think that they are such liars, give me a liars in the comments. Okay, so the next reason why they the way they package their, their lies is through gaslighting. And gaslighting is a, a, something that they use to try to make you think that you're crazy. And if you want to know more about gaslighting, check out my video on narcissist favorite gaslighting techniques. But um, they use gaslighting to try to make you think that you're crazy. So, and I've mentioned this before, but I haven't mentioned it in a while, so I'll mention it again for those of you who don't know. It actually comes from this old movie called Gaslight, and I think it was even a play before that, and then it became a movie, and it was like from the 30s or 40s, where the husband was trying to make the wife think that she was crazy. So he would blow out these gaslights throughout the house, and she would say, wasn't that just lit? And he would say, no, no, it wasn't. And she would then, you know, he was hoping that she would lose her mind. And that's what happens with narcissists. They start to gaslight you. They start to say things that are different than what was said before or to try to make, make you believe that something happened that didn't happen or something did happen that didn't happen, you know, and, and they just rewrite reality. Um, so, you know, I had a client one time who the ex-wife, the narcissistic ex-wife, threatened to call the authorities on him if he picked up the child at a certain time or something, a time that he was entitled to pick up the child. But she said, if you do, I'm calling the authorities. So he emails her back and says, you know, I really don't appreciate you threatening to call the cops on me. And this is exactly why I want this, this, and this done. And I want you to sign this agreement. Well, now she doesn't want to sign this agreement. She doesn't want to do these other things that he wants her to do. So she turns around to try to use it against him in a way and say, hey, I never said I was going to call the cops. I said I was going to call the authorities, which is something different. And you know, you know darn well that when she said, I'm calling the authorities, she meant the cops. But there's, there's a perfect opportunity for her, a perfect example of gaslighting. So now she's saying, that's not what I meant. And so, you know, he's supposed to go, oh, what did you mean? I wasn't that. Oh, okay. And, and, you know, and then now you're having a conversation about that. A perfect example of gaslighting. And But there's a type of lie, gaslighting is a type of lie that you might want to believe, you know, where they're saying now something different than what they said before, but you want to believe it because you don't want to believe that you are so wrong. I mean, a lot of times we want to believe it because we don't want to have to admit that we've been in a relationship with someone who is so horrible to us, who's so uh, untrustworthy, who's so dishonest. You know, I mean, we don't want to have to believe that ourselves. We don't want to have to think, oh my gosh, like, 
how could I have been so stupid or whatever? But just remember that narcissists are master manipulators. They're very good at reading people. They're very good at um, figuring out what it is that you want in the beginning. So you can't beat yourself up over that. So that's the most dangerous lie. The most dangerous lie is the one that you want to believe. And when you were getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist in any situation, business or personal or divorce or whatever, um, there is also an example of a dangerous lie because you might want to believe that they sincerely want to negotiate with you, that they sincerely want to settle the case, that they sincerely want to uh, make it right and have it be something that's amicable when they don't actually, when they are actually behind your back, stabbing your back, doing things to you, and then they say they're not. You know, you want to believe that. And that's where it can be very, very dangerous as well. Now, if you have a narcissist in your world, then you need to stop doing some certain things right now that may be costing you. Costing you what, may you ask? Costing you your sanity, your mental health, costing you money, costing you leverage, costing you things that you might want in your divorce action, costing you all kinds of things, including the life you want and on and on. So you're going to want to stop doing these things right now. And if you're not sure if you're married to a narcissist, then you're going to want to check out my video uh, called, Are You Married to a Narcissist? And I will drop a link to that one below. And if you are in a relationship with a narcissist, whether it's a marriage, whether it's a business partnership, friendship, neighbor, employee, boss, whatever, then you're going to want to stop doing these things right now. So drum roll, please. Number 10. Number 10 is never call them a narcissist. They hate that. Number one, they're never going to see themselves as a narcissist. And number two, then whatever you call them, that's what you're going to become because they always end up projecting, gaslighting, manipulating, all of those things that narcissists like to do. And it's just going to get turned around and become that that's what you are. And they're going to say that you have all of those traits and everything that you say. So you're going to end up being the one that's called the narcissist. So don't call them a narcissist. That's number 10. All right. Number nine. Number nine is don't let them cross boundaries that you've set. So if you've listened to some of my other videos or you've listened to my webinars or you've, you've followed me at all, then you know that what, one of the things that I say all the time is that you have to create really definite boundaries when you're dealing with narcissists. Narcissists don't respect boundaries. That's part of their entitlement and their control and all of the things that they're involved with. So if you go ahead and set boundaries, like I'm not going to allow this person into this part of my life, or I'm not going to allow this person to communicate with me in any way other than this particular way or I'm not going to allow this person to, you know, whatever it is. And you've laid down those boundaries. Now, if you let them cross those boundaries, now you're lowering the bar, lowering the bar, and they know exactly how much they have to push next time to get you to blow past those boundaries. Because as soon as you set a boundary, first thing they're going to do is try to blow past that. So you're actually conditioning that narcissist it's so almost like behavior modification uh, tactics. So every time you allow them to blow past that boundary, then they know that that's, they, they can just need, need to have a little bit more of a tantrum, have a little bit more of narcissistic rage next time, a little bit angrier, and you'll, you'll, you'll step back. So once you fix a boundary, you need to stay with it and never let them cross that. Okay, so that's number nine. Number eight is never allow them to disrespect you. This kind of goes hand in hand with the boundaries. I mean, they can do the things that they're going to do. They'll gaslight, manipulate, intimidate, get, get their, gather their flying monkeys on their side, do all the things that narcissists do, pathologically lie. But if you allow them to disrespect you by calling you names and things like that, then again, you are setting that goal, setting that, that standard for how far they can go. 
um, you know, I think it was Eleanor Roosevelt that said that no one can um, give you or treat you in any way that you don't give them permission to. And so don't give them permission to. Uh, if, they, if they disrespect you, you can very calmly say to them, I'm not going to have a conversation with you while you're disrespecting me. Or we can speak again later when you've gathered yourself and you're under control and you can speak to me in a way that is respectful. So, and as soon as you say that you're not respecting, you're not being respected, they'll say, well, you're not respecting me. So you can just say, absolutely, I'm respecting you. And that's why I don't think it's, it's productive for us to have a conversation right now or whatever you need to say. But the next one is, Stop letting them disrespect you. All right, number seven is stop expecting them to take responsibility for their actions. They're not going to. That's part of being a narcissist. They're not going to say, oh, you know, I really shouldn't have treated you like that, or um, you're right, I screwed up at that project, or I mean, I've had employees like that in my law practice where you know, it's mistake after mistake after mistake. And, you know, it's always someone else's fault some or something else that happened. It's never their fault. Um, and that's what you're going to see with narcissists too. So stop expecting them to take responsibility for their actions. They're not going to. And number six, stop explaining or justifying. When you get those emails that, that are very clearly meant to trigger you, but call you the deadbeat dad or call you the crappy mom or say that you're irresponsible or whatever. I mean, they're, they're trying to bait you. They're trying to goad you. They're trying to inflame you. They're trying to incite you. That's what narcissists do because that's how they get control over you. Once you, you lose control, then they know that they have you. So, you know, if you go into this whole thing where you're trying to explain, you're trying to defend, you're trying to justify, you're, you're oversharing all these things, then you're just giving them control. Again, you're handing them control. So stop doing that. Stop explaining. Stop justifying. Stop trying to uh, get them to see what you're trying to say. It, it, it's pointless anyway. And so um, just save your energy on that. And if you know what I'm saying so far is the truth, Give me a truth in the comments. All right, number five. Number five is stop giving them ammunition. Remember that every text, every email, everything that you put in writing will always be used against you if they can. So don't give them ammunition. Don't behave in a way that gives them ammunition. Don't say anything that gives you ammunition. And believe me, I know that what I'm telling you to do right now is almost superhuman. You have to be Superman or Wonder Woman and just have the strength and the discipline to not react. But, um, you know, if you need to go and react, go and react outside of the presence of that narcissist. Scream, at, you know, when you're in therapy, scream to your best friend, scream to, you know, your pillow, go home and yell, go in the bathroom and cry, you know, um, whatever you need to do, but don't show the narcissist that they've gotten to you. Don't you dare do that. And don't give them any ammunition. All right, number four is don't take anything personally. Remember that the narcissist inside is the scared little hollow chocolate Easter bunny that has absolutely nothing inside, has no ability to have any empathy, any compassion, or any caring for any single person but themselves. It's all about self-preservation for them. It's like as if you have a really bad toothache and it, when you have a really terrible toothache, all you can feel is that toothache. You don't really understand what, what, what impact you might be having on somebody else if you scream at them or you yell at them or whatever. That's what's going on with the narcissist. Everything is manipulated and for their use to make themselves feel better, to give them that narcissistic supply. They'll grab onto it like, like those hitchhiker things that stick onto clothes, whatever they can do to grab onto something to give them narcissistic supply. It's all about them. So you can't ever take it personally it, when they cut you down, when they are nasty to you, when they 
uh, degrade you, devalue you. It's all about trying to make themselves feel better. It has nothing to do with you and it has nothing to do with your value as a human being. So remember that and never take anything personally. All right, number three, stop expecting them to have empathy, care, concern, or compassion. Stop expecting that. They're not going to give it to you. As I said, they don't have the ability to give it to you. You know, people can only give what they have. And you're seriously expecting blood out of a stone. It's not going to happen. They just don't have the ability to. It's like wishing someone had an arm if they don't. If somebody doesn't have arms, you can't go and tell them to go pick up something off the floor with their hands because they don't have them. So, and that's what you're basically expecting a narcissist to do when you're expecting care, compassion, empathy, or concern. It doesn't exist for them. They don't even understand really what you're saying, to be honest with you. It's like, you know, speaking a different language. They, they understand that other people have that, I think, but they don't have it. So stop expecting it. All right, number two, don't underestimate them. Don't underestimate how far they will go how far they will go to protect their ego, how far they will go to maintain control, how far they will go to make themselves look good and you look bad. They'll basically do whatever they can get away with. So, and even then some, you know, so they'll, they'll do whatever they need to do for their own self-preservation and to make, make it make sure that they're the ones that come out smelling like the rose or looks like they're the ones wearing the white hat versus the black hat or whatever it is um, that they need to do their survival instinct is strong and they've been manipulating since the beginning of time for themselves so you know that whole 10,000 hours to become an expert at something well they've got way more hours than that they are master manipulators so don't underestimate them. Don't give them the benefit of the doubt. They don't deserve it. And don't underestimate how far they'll go. And number one, number one is don't waste your breath, energy, time, mental power, or anything else trying to get them to see the error of their ways. Don't get them, try to get them to see, geez, look what you're doing to the children. They don't care. Look what you're doing to me. They don't care. Look at the impact that you're, you're having on this or that. They don't care. All they care about is self-preservation and survival. So if you sit there and you try to say, you know, look at how much I've done for you. I can't believe you're doing this to me. This doesn't even make any sense. What you're saying doesn't even make any sense. It's not reasonable. Wasting breath, wasting breath, wasting energy, okay? They're not going to see the error of their ways. You can try to point out uh, that they lied in a text message that, you know, I just recently got an email from someone that said that, you know, they have an email where the person got a text from, or it was a text that they had gotten from some woman they were cheating with, and it specifically said all kinds of sexual things. And yet he stood right there and, and said to her, I'm not cheating. And, and, and she just said she was trying to fight back with him and trying to show him, well, that doesn't, you know, waste of time. Waste of time, waste of energy. Spend your time on your strategy. Spend your time on your communication skills. Spend your time on, on plotting how you're going to get out of this relationship with this person, if you can. Spend your time on something that's productive, like self-care for yourself. I have a whole video on self-care with a narcissist, and I will drop a link to that below. Spend your time on how you're going to outsmart the nar narcissist. I have a video on that, and I'll drop a link to that one below. But don't spend your time trying to get them to see the error of their ways or how they're impacting anyone else. They're not gonna see it, and your time is better spent somewhere else, like on you. Okay, so let's talk about Operation Triangulation. If you have dealt with a narcissist in any way, shape, or form, then you have dealt with triangulation. 
Another word for it is flying monkeys. And if you want to know more about the word flying monkeys and all of that, go check out my video on flying monkeys. So this is a tactic that narcissists use. So remember, they need an endless amount of supply. They are supply whores. They must have it. They must have it in any way, shape, or form that they can possibly get it. Anything that they can have to feed that ego. It's like oxygen, food. It, it's their lifeblood. It's like what they breathe in, they must have. And they, they literally will take it from everywhere they can get it. So one of the ways that they can get it, and it actually kind of works out pretty well for them because when they triangulate, they're getting the attention from the flying monkey or that person that they're triangulating with. And it has the benefit, the added benefit, the little bonus sugar cherry on top of making you miserable. So they get both. So it's like so beautiful for them. They, they, they actually figured out a way to not only get supply out of you, but they can get it out of multiple places at once. Isn't that fantastic? So they get to uh, have this other person adulate them and think that they're so wonderful. And you are over there going, what are you doing with this person? Who are you talking to? What are you saying? Uh, or they come back and they say, I spoke with Mary over there and Mary agrees with me that you're crazy or that you don't appreciate me or that you treat me badly or how wrong it is that you don't believe everything that I say. And whether Mary said that or not, it doesn't even matter because it serves the purpose that they want to serve, which is, you know, making you miserable. So um, that's what they do. They line up their flying monkeys. It's a, a reference to the Wicked Witch from, uh, from Wizard of Oz, where they had, she had those flying monkeys like ee, 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 next to her. And they would just fly around and report back to the Wicked Witch and let the Wicked Witch know what was going on. Dorothy and the Tin Man and the Scarecrow and the Lion, they're just walking along the, gold, the yellow brick road, all, you know, innocent and happy. And there's the flying monkeys like coming along to see what's going on and reporting back, just like the little minions. And that's what happens with narcissists as well. They have their little minions that are looking to see what's going on in social media. And then they would go running back, scurrying back, and they tell the narcissist what's going on. Oh my goodness, they posted this, or they went there, or I saw them say this. And oh, let's all scurry and figure out what they're talking about. And you're over there feeling left out, feeling isolated, paranoid, wondering what's going on. Then you go ask the narcissist about it. And they love that, love that, because it's working then. Now you're worried, now you're upset. They know that they got you. So, you know, oh, you wanna know what I was talking about with uh, Mary over there? Well, I'm not gonna tell you. Or Mary said this, or Mary said that. And now you're bothered, because they want you to feel bothered. They want you to feel like you're left out in the cold, like you're isolated. Um, and a lot of the times they use those, their, their special phrases, like everybody else thinks this and no one else thinks that. Um, if you want to know more about the narcissist's favorite phrases, check out my video on that topic. Um, but the whole point of it is to try to make you feel bad. And if you are so sick of those flying monkeys, say banish flying monkeys in the comments below. Just say banish flying monkeys because they really do need to be banished. I know when I was dealing with a couple of narcissists in my life, um, you know, I, I had that situation and, you know, as long as you're still in the narcissist space, you're giving them opportunities to like use their um, operation triangulation to try to get at you. And 
you know, the best thing that you can do, honestly, is just not react at all. Just act like you don't really care who they're talking to. You don't really care what they're saying. Don't even ask them about it. Don't even acknowledge that they had a conversation with that person. Because as soon as you do that, you're giving them narcissistic supply. You're giving into that. And it's funny because I kind of knew that before I even um, knew these terms. I had never heard of the term triangulation. I had never heard of flying monkeys. I, had, I, I And to me, narcissists were like, people who were going around bragging about themselves all the time. I honestly didn't really even know what a narcissist was. I didn't know anything about covert narcissists until somebody said the word to me. Um, and, and that's when I started to figure it out. And by the way, Operation Triangulation is a favorite of the coverts. They love it, love it. So if you're dealing with a covert narcissist, you're definitely dealing with triangulation, but all narcissists like to use triangulation. It's one of their little favorite go-to bag of tricks. Um, and so if you know that you're with somebody, whether it's in a business setting or a personal setting, and they're, they're, they're trying to make you jealous or they're trying to use other people to somehow evoke a response from you, then you're probably with a narcissist and it's probably time to, you know, head out the door and, and figure out a way to get out of this relationship. So if you were getting ready to negotiate with a narcissist, uh, especially, you know, any kind of difficult person, it, it, whether it's a narcissist or not, by the way, it doesn't even matter if they've actually been labeled as a narcissist. It could just be a jackass, but if they're extremely difficult to deal with then, you know, it's going to be the same, right? Now let's talk about what those narcissists are hiding behind that mask. What is their true agenda? What is it they really want from you? So what narcissists don't want you to know is that they are actually really scared little beings inside that massive wall of, 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 of ego that they build around them whether they are a covert narcissist, a grandiose narcissist, or a malignant narcissist, or whatever kind that you're dealing with, even maybe it's a combination of one of those, um, they are really, really just scared people. Something happened to them when they were a child, they were traumatized in some way, not loved enough, they came to this conclusion somehow that the world is a scary place. The world is a place that they have to um, survive. And, and, and it's survival of the fittest for them. It's, it's, you know, if you survive, then I can't. If, if you have something, then I don't have it. It's, it's, it's scarcity mentality at its most extreme. And so what they really don't want you to know is that they are actually the weaker one. You are actually the stronger one as their narcissistic supply. And narcissistic supply is anything that feeds their ego. It's their lifeblood. It's their... Um, oxygen, it's their food, it's, it's what they need. And, and it's what they use, what they, what they need to suck out of from every single person that they meet. Um, and if you want to know more about narcissistic supply, definitely check out my video on narcissistic supply and, and actually have a whole narcissism 101 series that defines the main terms that you need to know in, when you're dealing with narcissists, a whole language you were never hoping that you wanted to know, but here you are knowing it, right? But I will say that once you do know the language and once you do understand how narcissists are and that this is what it is that you're dealing with, it makes your life so much easier. You start to go, oh my gosh, that's what I'm dealing with. That's that's the world that, that this person lives in. It actually has nothing to do with me. I was just what they latched onto for supply. And so once you start understanding that, it makes it so much easier for you to start to formulate a plan 
to get out of this situation. And that's where I come in and that's where my resources come in and hours and hours of free content here on YouTube and hours and hours of free content on my podcast. And I even have all kinds of other free resources such as my Crush My Negotiation prep worksheet, et cetera, because I want you to have the tools that you need step-by-step to get out of this situation and have the courage to know how to do it because you have the right tools to do it. So let's now talk more about the, um, what the narcissists are hiding, you know, what's their true agenda. Okay. So what they start off with is love bombing. And so they're hiding behind this love bombing. It's really the stage where they are grooming you. They're, 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 investing in you so that when they, during the devalue stage, they can get that return on their investment. It's really a form of manipulation. And if you want to know more about love bombing, you can check out my video on love bombing, but it's a form of manipulation. And so they're hiding their true agenda when they're love bombing you. They're, they're setting themselves up to look perfect for you, whether it's the perfect job, the perfect business partner, the perfect spouse, the perfect romantic partner, the perfect friend, the perfect neighbor, whatever it is, they're setting themselves up to be that perfect person for you so that they can, um, you know, get into your world get you into their web. It's almost like a black widow that gets, spins you into their web. And then once you're there, they can suck the blood out of you. And I know that sounds really dramatic, but that's, that really is what it is. Um, so they're hiding their true agenda during that love bomb phase. And by the way, they are master manipulators. You cannot feel bad that you ended up in a relationship with a narcissist. I did too. I ended up with two of these heinous creatures in my life. They are no longer in my life. I am happy to say that I have got no contact. I set those boundaries. I take the advice that I give to you. I take the information that I've learned on how to be a master negotiator and I give that information to you and I've taken my own advice and I've, um, it has worked. So, you know, don't feel bad about the fact that you ended up into their lair, their web, because they have been working on becoming master manipulators since childhood. That's their way of being. So they know how to be charismatic. They know that they can't come in and start devaluing you because then you'll never end up wanting to be near them. So but then the next stage is that, uh, you know, part of their true agenda is that devalue stage. And that's where they start to get that return on their investment of the love bombing. That's when they, they start to suck that, that narcissistic supply right on out of you. And if you are so ready to expose them, give me a game over in the comments. So another way that they hide their true agendas is they engage their flying monkeys. And that's when you see the birth of the smear campaign and all that. And, and they're so good, by the way, at hiding their true agenda of making themselves look good, making you look bad by talking to their flying monkeys. And they say things like, I, it's so funny. I was just talking to a guy yesterday he was in the UK and he was talking about how, um, the, the soon to be ex, uh, wife is saying things to his own family. I'm so concerned about his mental state. I'm not really sure if, you know, he's really up to the task of, having the children 50% of the time because I'm really concerned about him. So they hide their true agenda of, you know, taking you down, punishing you with having, the, you know, you get less time with the kids or whatever with this, oh, I'm just really concerned. Um, and so that's another way they hide their, their true agenda is like expressing feigned concern for the person um, by lining up their flying monkeys and engaging in an underhanded smear campaign. And the last one 
is playing the victim. And, you know, they hide their true agenda of, you know, I need the supply, I want the attention. Um, and so they, you know, play the victim. Oh, life isn't fair, especially, you especially see this with the coverts. And um, if you want to know more about why covert narcissists are the worst, Check out my video on why covert narcissists are the worst. I cannot stand them because they are the under the radar ones. And the two that I had to deal with were both covert narcissists too. And, um, you know, the whole rest of the world thinks that they are so nice and, oh, they just got a bad rap and they're just the victim. And, you know, you're the one that caused all of their problems. You're the bad one. Um, you know, life isn't fair for them. And so the world sees this and sees them as this good person. And look at you, the, 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 the Satan of this thing, you know, that you caused all of these problems or that you're the bad one in the relationship. Um, and they set it up so that it's, you know, plausible that you're the bad one and that all the stuff that they did, this plausible deniability is what they have because it's, it's, it's so subtle that, you know, it, 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 it's hard to pin it back onto them or it doesn't sound that bad if you try to explain to somebody else what's going on. So let's talk about why a narcissist does that. Why do they constantly move the goalposts in negotiations? Well, first of all, I think it's important that you understand what's going on in the mind, the mentality of a narcissist so that you can understand why they do that. So a narcissist feeds on what we call narcissistic supply. That's what's going on in the mind of a narcissist. They have no inner sense of self. They have to get derive all of their value from the external world. And they do that in what we call a form of what we call narcissistic supply. And supply is basically anything that feeds their ego. And it's really not just an ego trip like for what would be great for most of us. I mean, all of us love to feel seen, heard, know that we matter. I mean, that's part of being a human. So it, it, I look at narcissism as kind of like on a continuum. We, are, we all want to feel seen, heard, and know that we matter. But most of us also can see that that's how other people want to feel as well. And so we feel love for them. We feel care for them. We feel compassion for them. Narcissists, are, they live in this world of scarcity. It's like survival for them. If they feel like if, if they give anything or, or if somebody else gets something, then that means they can't have it. That somehow that they're not going to survive or, or the world is, is going to come crashing down on them. And so narcissistic supply has become their lifeblood, their oxygen, their food. It's, it's what they need to live on. And when they're dealing with somebody in litigation, it just becomes five million times worse. I mean, they're exactly how they were during the relationship, but on steroids. And now when you're into that discard phase of the relationship, and if you want to know more about the discard phase, you should definitely check out my video on narcissistic discarding. But that's when you start to see the birth of the smear campaign. That's when they start to line up their flying monkeys and they start to go, you know, okay, I, I need to take this other person down before they take me down. And so I need to go on the offensive and, and go nuts on them. And they, they have an agenda and that agenda is to take you down. And so right from the beginning, you are on a completely different path a completely different mindset than the, the narcissist because the reasonable person, you reasonable person will think, 
well, I don't want to spend a lot of money on lawyers. I don't want this to be a long drawn out process. What does the law say? Let me figure that out and let me figure out what's fair under the law. And so you have this mistaken belief that that's where they are too, that they also want that. And they will even tell you that. You know, why are you being so unreasonable? Why can't you just settle this case? Why are you dragging this out? They'll project all of that out onto you. And you'll be sitting and thinking, but you're the one who's dragging it out. You're the one who filed all these extra pleadings. You're the one that falsely accused me of child abuse or um, you know, domestic violence or whatever it is. But they'll say that you're the one dragging it out. And the reason why they do that it comes back to that concept of narcissistic supply. And that supply is what they get from dragging out the court's uh, case or, or moving that goalpost on you because they enjoy watching you squirm. They enjoy the process of seeing you grovel of seeing you be afraid, of seeing you feel intimidated, of keeping you involved in the situation. I've had clients who were narcissists who said to me, I'd rather pay you than her or you than him because they actually, I mean, why would they say that? Why would they say I'd rather pay the attorney than the other person? Yes, on the surface, it looks like because they don't want the other person to have the money. But why? Why is that? It's probably because they enjoy watching the other person be hurt. They enjoy making you squirm. And so what will happen, what, what I mean when I say move the goalposts, is you will be trying to settle a case and so your lawyer might send over a settlement proposal and you're waiting for a settlement proposal back and maybe you finally get one and it's this counter offer and it's way worse than what you sent over. And by the way, do not engage in this letter writing thing with lawyers if you're dealing with a narcissist. It's a waste of time, a waste of money, a big fat exercise, and it's feeding their need for supply. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not anything that you want to engage in because it's not going to get you anywhere. So, and by the way, if you are so ready to break free, I want to see a, I'm ready in the comments. So what happens is, is you will be going back and forth with these letters and maybe you finally get a. Uh, some sort of, uh, of settlement proposal that you think, well, you know, it's not what I wanted. And, and you might even spend three days talking about it to everybody that you trust, you know, your mother or whoever, and your lawyer, and you spend three sleepless nights because you think, wait, it's way worse than what I wanted to settle for, but fine, I will go ahead and I will give into it. I will give them everything they wanted just because I want this thing to be done. I want it to be over with. I want to get on with my life. So you go back and you say, yes, fine, I'll take it. And your lawyer even says, well, this is way worse than you would do under the law. You wouldn't even do this what, you know, badly if you go to court blah, blah, blah. You don't care. You just want out of it. I just want to be done. So you say, okay, guess what? That's offers, that offer is no longer on the table anymore. Now it's something else. Now it's this plus this or this minus that. And on top of that, it's your fault. It's your fault that they had to move the goalpost because you waited too long, you, you did something else within that three-day period, or they found out something that you did or didn't do. They might have even contrived it. It's something completely made up. But because of that, now that's no longer the offer. Now, if you want to take it, it's something else, something worse, of course, or something way more than what you're willing to give. 
And once again, you're, you're in this position, but now you've locked yourself in because now they know that you have given in on this particular proposal. So anytime you try to go back and ask for more again, they're going to go, no, 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 no. They're going to want to hold you to whatever it was that you had agreed to. And then you try to say, well, no, I only agreed to that because I thought I was going to be done with this thing. But now that you've added all these other things, I'm not agreeing to that. So they, they want to hold you to the parts that they want to hold you to, but then they want more for them or less money that they have to pay you or whatever it is. So that's what I mean by moving the goalposts. And the reason why they do that is because they get narcissistic supply from from doing that, from watching you squirm and keeping you involved in somehow and intimidating you. So that's why I created my SLAY program because it stands for super strong strategy, creating invincible leverage, anticipating what the narcissist is going to do and being two steps ahead of them and focusing on you, your position and your case so that you can go actually on the offensive for a change and not constantly feel like you're on the defensive. And it, that's the only way that you will actually be able to shift this dynamic, the only way, because otherwise they will continue to move that goalpost. And I've had people say to me that their cases have taken years and years and years, or, or I've seen it myself when I've been litigating these cases. And, you know, a, a lot of time people mistakenly think, all I need is a good lawyer. Just find me a good lawyer. That's the be all end all. That's the panacea. That's what I need. That's not the only thing that you need. A, a, a good lawyer needs to be just a portion of the strategy that you are creating. And that's where I create, why I created the SLAY program. There are many, many, many people who can tell you horror stories about how they found a great lawyer and two years later, three years later, five years later, here they are still litigating and you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars later, they're nowhere. And that's because they didn't learn properly how to create strategy and leverage in a way that's going to actually make the narcissist be feel squeezed and motivated to actually want to resolve the case with you.